Hi, my name is Carol Wyatt Evans, and I want to say welcome to today's presentation, Urban IPM, Integrated Pest Management for Insects in the Home. Now, to start with, we'll do a quick overview of basically general insect information. We'll talk about why insects love our homes. We'll talk a little bit about um, integrated pest management. Then we'll go into general information on how to keep insects out of your home. And then we'll go into specific insects that we find here in Florida. Now, there are about 1 million described species of insects uh, in the world, with about 91,000 of those found here in the United States. But here in Florida, we have over 12,500 species of arthropods. So it is good that you're here, here today. So there are approximately 2 billion insects for each human being, which is a little alarming, but there are very few insects that are actually invaders of our homes. And of all the insects, about 98% of them are usually either beneficial or they play some part in the ecosystem, especially as serving as food for other insects and wildlife. Now we may think that insects come into our home to be annoying, but like all living things, they're looking for three things. That's food, water, and shelter. So if the environment in your home provides these things, then you're most likely going to have some unwelcome guests. So the key is to apply preventative insect management strategies to make your home not insect friendly. So prevention is the safest, easiest, and cheapest way to stop them from setting up house. Now, there are three main approaches to keeping insects outside and to make your house less attractive to them. So one is focusing on pest proofing and then sanitation strategies, and if necessary, using impact, uh, low impact pesticides. Now the emphasis should always be on non-chemical practices. Um, and so this is a strategy called integrated pest management or IPM. And this does include the use of that low impact pesticides, but only after those other attempts have failed and when, you know, when they're actually necessary. Now, chemicals should never be the go-to choice for pest management, but it is part of that management strategy. But all these things lead to improvement in pest control and indoor air quality, and not to mention peace of mind. Um, these processes are also part of like weatherproofing your home. So this also keeps money in your pocket. Now, for our own good and the health of our planet, we really need to reconsider our dependence on chemicals. There were widespread use of chemicals after World War II, and chemicals have since seeped into about 90% of our streams and waters. So um, according to the CDC, their studies have shown that, there are, uh, that Americans have approximately 43 different pesticides in our bloodstream. Now, chemicals can trigger everything from nausea to vomiting to headaches to more serious health concerns. So like lung damage, reproductive problems, and cancer. So especially hazardous to children. So spending, um, that's because they spend uh, more time closer to the ground. Their size makes them more sensitive to chemicals. And then their developing brains are more susceptible to neurological problems. And they lead to, you know, potentially learning disabilities, which are caused by the exposure to some of those chemicals. But half of the pesticide poisonings in the U.S. were of children under the age of six. So really, you know, please always think twice before you pick up any sort of a, you know, a product, a, a pesticide product, and use any sort of a chemical um, on an insect infestation. You know, think if there might be another, you know, another option or a better option or an alternative option to using that product. Now, insecticides are not always effective against insects. You know, that's due to their overuse and applying them to the wrong life stage of that insect. Eradication is very difficult and usually not successful since many insects have, have multiple life stages in the same area. And then insecticides may only target one of these life stages, but not all of them. Now, fleas are a good example for this. Now, fleas can go from an egg to an adult in one month, and they go through the four life stages. So that's egg, larvae, pupa, and adult. And typically, conventional flea treatments only target the, that full-grown adult life stage of that flea. Chemical exposure can trigger dizziness, vomiting, convulsions, 
and potentially have long-term effects on you know, learning and behaviors. So you really need to think twice before you, you're learning, you're using some of these products. Now, treatments can also backfire. There are some ant species that will divide a colony and increase their reproduction after a chemical treatment. Bugs also can become uh, resistant to pesticides when they're exposed over and over again to that same active ingredient in that product or in a product. So if you are using insecticides, you need to consider using bioirrational products or bioirrational pesticides, which are less toxic alternatives but are better for the environment and better for us. Part of the bioirrational pesticide products include insect growth regulators or IGRs, and they are very effective and very safe. So since insects need to molt or shed their outer skin or their exoskeleton to grow, IGRs, what they do is they interfere with that process and they stop that insect from becoming an adult. Thus, it stops that insect from reproducing. Because if we think about insects, we think of that immature stage as really the growth stage, um, just like our own children. And then the adult stage is the reproductive stage. And a lot of those adults actually don't even feed. But if we can stop that molting process, we can stop them from becoming adults and therefore stop that reproduction. But the reason they're so safe for us to use is that since we don't have an exoskeleton and we do not molt, then these products are very safe products to use both around us as well as our pets. Now, the best control strategy is really applying that process called integrated pest management. Now, IPM is a decision-making process for pest control that uses regular monitoring to determine if and when treatments uh, you know, are necessary. And then you evaluate those effectiveness, the, the, their effectiveness. So did those steps work or do you need to do something else in addition to doing that? But being proactive means to stop pests from entering the house in the first place. It's using a combination of methods that keep pests out without having to use harsh chemicals or compounds that can harm the environment, can harm us or harm our pets. It's truly the environmentally responsible way to pest management. So in IPM, those non-chemical methods and pest prevention are emphasized and pesticides are used only as that last resort when all those other approaches didn't fully work. Now, the goal of IPM is actually to achieve long-term, cost-effective, and environmentally sound pest control using the least invasive method possible. So using pesticides sparingly and only when necessary means that we minimize our exposure to chemicals, and it also prolongs the effectiveness of that product. So the insects do not build up in insecticide resistance as quickly if you're either rotating the, those products or you're really minimizing their use. So really, you, know, you can think of IPM as being proactive versus reactive, and that prevention is the key. Now, this is the IPM pyramid. If you think, if you remember that old food pyramid that we had, well, this is really based off that. So if you think about it, the things on the bottom is what is best for you and what you want to do the most of. And the things at the top are the things that should be used sparingly, right? So when you think about this pyramid, you think about prevention. You want to do the most with prevention. And as you make it to the very top is when you need chemical intervention. But really, you're going, you know, prevention to intervention, proactive to reactive. And when you're at the bottom of the pyramid, it's always the most envir environmentally sound, the safest and the most uh, cost-effective approach. So the next two slides are gonna be general steps that you can take to keep almost all insects and rodents out of your house. So as we discuss specific insects, I will you know, talk about additional things that you can do to keep them out, which are based on their life, life cycles or their behaviors. So in general, thinking of what you can do on the outside of your home to keep insects out starts with remembering that insects are very tiny and they are usually a lot of them. So insects can fit through tiny holes and cracks and get into the home. 
So you're, what you're going to want to do is seal up any cracks um, that you have on the exterior of your house with caulking or with mortar if you have brick. And then um, mesh screen. So putting mesh screen over any entry points. So this includes things like your dryer vents or larger areas around like hose bibs that come through the wall. And then insects require moisture. So you're gonna to wanna to check for leaky faucets, as well as um, you know, facing irrigation heads away from your house, that it's only spraying the yard and not your house. This is also gonna reduce any mold and mildew buildup on your house. And then many insects love that organic debris in the, debris in the gutter. So you really wanna make sure you're cleaning out your gutters on a regular basis. This is a real big harborage for mosquito larvae as well. So you really wanna uh, pay particular uh, attention to those, those rain gutters. Now, insects usually use tree trees and shrubs um, that touch the house to get access into your house and to your attic. So you know, don't allow branches um, to, to touch your house or to, to rest against your house. Now termites, spiders, and other insects like to nest in wood. So you're gonna to wanna to keep any wood or debris piles at least 20 feet away from the house. And then many flying insects get in through like tears in your lanai and your window screens. So be sure to repair any rips in, in your screen. There's a really easy or simple um, type of tape that you can buy at any big box store or over the internet. Um, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mesh tape, a screen tape that you just, you know, break off pieces and put over those rips or tears in your, your screens, and it does a fabulous job. But the other thing is that all insect, well, most insects are actually attracted to light. So turning off unnecessary lights or changing that light bulb to a yellow or, a, or an orange colored light bulb is gonna be more effective than just an, a typically a typical uh, incandescent light. Um, that's because insects can't see in that, in, in that um, yellow and orange wavelength. So that's why you'd want to have a yellow or an orange light bulb, but also changing that to an LED bulb because that puts off less heat and insects are also attracted to the heat. The other thing about that is that insects attracted to the light then attract bigger critters such as like frogs and toads, spiders and lizards that will feed on those insects. So keeping those lights off or changing those lights, those light bulbs to a yellow or an orange um, LED is really gonna benefit you in multiple ways. Now, talked about the outside, let's talk about the inside. Again, these are just general, general steps you can take. take. So first thing you wanna do is to clear out any clutter and clean up any potential food sources. So this includes crumbs, oil droplets, um, that type of thing. And then making sure to keep your pet food, your flour, or any other products that tend to come in bags that you, you, know, you roll down the top, if you keep those in resealable containers, whether that means put them in a Ziploc type bag or put them into a container that has a seal, uh, a sealing lid that, that has a rubber gasket to it. Then taking out your garbage frequently, and that's especially if there's a lot of food in it. Um, using garbage cans that have a lid, preferably with a rubber gasket that can close. And then often insects enter the home through gaps and cracks where that where piping enters the home. So that's gonna be both your plumbing and your electrical. So patching and sealing up any gaps that could allow insects to enter is gonna be very beneficial. And then also pests love moist areas. So you know, mold and mildew are signs that there's a leak somewhere. So fixing those leaks are gonna stop you know, that mold and mildew, but it's also gonna be less attractive for insects in that area. And then your attics. Attics should be dry and well ventilated. They should never smell musty. Um, checking your plants, you know, your plants, your bags, boxes that you bring into the house for hitchhikers. And then inspecting your luggage, um, right? It's, we're coming up on summertime, inspecting your luggage when you return from a trip. And this is typically or mainly to look for bed bugs because they are the world's number one hitchhiker. 
Now, here's the thing a lot of people, you know, especially for people who may, uh, you know, who may go up north for the summer and then come back for our, our winter seasons, but running the bathroom water weekly and flushing the toilet weekly um, is going to help keep both uh, cockroaches and drain flies from infesting those areas. And then being sure also to pour water down that overflow outlet that's in your sink and in your bathtub, because that's a that's just a, a um, empty basin, but that's a place where a lot of cockroaches are going to be hiding. Now, repair or replace that old weather stripping. Um, weather stripping and caulking are probably two of the cheapest and the easiest fi fixes for keeping insects out of your home. Now, a good way to check for, um, for tiny openings that are around like your sliding glass doors and your windows and your, and your window frames is to turn off the lights. It's easier to do at night. To turn off the lights, have two people. It's easier with two people. Um, shine a flashlight. Have one person on one side, one person on the other. Shine a flashlight along those edges, right? And so that way, if that person on the other side sees any bit of a light stream coming through that those windows or those, you know, any gaps is to make sure that those are the areas that you're going to want to change that weather stripping because if light gets through, then an insect can get through. And then as we talked about the taking turning off the outside lights, you also want to turn off inside lights, you know, unnecessary inside lights. Um, because anything that shines through the window is going to be an attractant to insects. And if you're attracting them to the windows, then they're going to look for a place to get inside. And then finally, on this vacuuming and declutter, um, this is going to eliminate hiding spots and also reduce the number of eggs and immature insects that might be in those hiding spots. Now, as far as food source, Many insects are drawn to overripe fruit. So keeping ripe fruit in the refrigerator is, is you know, kind of a key. <laughs> so fruits that are left on the counter are just a huge invitation to like fruit flies and forward flies. Um, and then you know what they, they're going to do is they're going to come land on that fruit and they're going to deposit their eggs. But they're also going to be, you know, flies tend to carry a lot of other bacteria with them. So, you know, keeping ripe fruit in the refrigerator is important. And then um, cleaning your countertops nightly. This is really good for all kinds of reasons, but really you're not going to wake up to an ant infestation if you know you're cleaning your, your countertops at night. And then cleaning up any grease splatters, right? So this means, you know, if we're frying on the, on the stove and it a little bit gets on the backsplash, a lot of times when we're cleaning, we forget about that. Well, a, a drop or a splatter of grease is really a buffet for a cockroach. So you're wanting to make sure you clean all those areas. You can clean it with soap and water, or you can clean it with a Wonder One vinegar water. Um, both of those work exceptionally well for that. And then cover and sealing any leftovers. So if you could see how a fly feeds, um, you would never want a fly landing on your food and, you know, and, and walking across your food. And then finally, um, don't leave any pet food bowls out that have food in them. Um, it's really just an open invitation for ants and cockroaches. I reared millions and millions of ants and cockroaches in a, in a previous uh, job that I worked in. And what we fed them was dog food and cat food. So um, leaving cat food bowls and dog food bowls out at night, both inside and outside the house, is just um, you know, just inviting insects into that area. Now, sealing it up. So seal up your cracks in your bathroom and your kitchen with silicone caulking, right? All those little areas where that caulking has started to pull away is an area where an insect can get through. And then plugging openings larger than a quarter of an inch wide. Um, this is important because mice can wiggle through very, very small holes. A good rule of thumb is any, any, any hole that is the size of a quarter, I would even say, you know, the size of a nickel, um, that's kind of my policy at home, anything the size of a quarter um, should be sealed up with either cement 
um, steel wool or some other type of metal mesh. And that is because vermin, so our rodents, our mice and our rats can chew through plastic, they can chew through rubber, vinyl and wood. The only thing they can't chew through is metal. So really important, especially if you've had a previous infestation of either rats or mice, very important to be using some sort of a metal um, barrier in those areas. Now, don't forget about your garage. The garage is a perfect environment for insects and rodents. So if you have newspapers that pile up in your garage, right, you're just like, keep forgetting to recycle them. Just know that rats shred newspaper and they use those scraps to build their nests. Now, if you have corrugated cardboard or cardboard in your garage, you really want to recycle that. Get that out of your garage because cockroaches use cardboard for their harborage or their shelter and they lay their eggs inside that corrugation. So if you pull that cardboard apart, a lot of times you're going to see immature cockroaches running around in there or you're going to see cockroach eggs, which are called ootheicas, glued inside of that cardboard. So what's best to do is to use plastic bins or plastic totes that have tight sealing lids. That's gonna be, you know, that's gonna benefit you in keeping cockroaches, spiders, silverfish out of your boxes and out of your garage. So pet food that's stored in the original bag, you know, with the top folded down, a lot of times that's a real easy way to do it. Well, all insects, especially cockroaches, love pet food. So what you're gonna to wanna to do, you can use that bag, but store it in a larger container. Again, preferably something that has a, a closure system on top, right? A, a lid that seals that has a rubber gasket on it. So you can either put, pour that you know, food into that, or you can take the whole bag and just put it in there, but anything that has a sealing lid on it. Now, as far as IPM, you can think of IPM as going green. So really your first line of defense is gonna be the fly swatter, right? It's a great way to get rid of something, a fly or a spider. I tend to carry my spiders outside, but um, some unwanted guests, insect guests that's in your house, a fly swatter does, does the best job, right? You're doing the job with the least invasive method. So you're not having to use chemicals and the problem has been solved. Now. Other non-toxic methods are things like mouse traps or fly traps or jar traps, which you can make your own. There are some types of pheromone traps, a little bit harder to find, and then other non-toxic baits. I'm a big proponent of baits for ants and cockroaches inside the house, but we'll get into that later. But for cracks and crevices, um, you can do things like you can dust with a boric acid powder, um, or a diatomaceous earth, which is also called DE. But you can do that both inside the house in a line, like usually right, right along the baseboard in a very, very fine line. This is really good for things like um, silverfish and ants. Um, not so much as cockroaches because they don't, they don't touch the ground as much, but ants and silverfish um, and other smaller insects that are closer to the ground. Um, these boric acid and, and DE both works really well for those. You can also scrub the area with, with insecticidal or, or, or soap, fatty acid soaps. Um, this is safer for people um, unless, you know, unless you get, you know, ingest them, but you know, that's that's not something we tend to do is we tend to not drink soap water. But insecticidal soaps uh, or, or you know, regular soaps are really good product to use because it also for ants, it'll clean up things like the pheromone trail that they leave behind. So, um, you know, no, you, no need to use some really harsh chemical to, to be cleaning. Now, you know, pesticide should be used as a, as a last resort. And this is only if everything fails and, you know, these rodents or your insects are persistent. Um, but make sure you're reading the label. You're following the label instructions because the label is the law. Make sure you're wearing the proper PPE, the personal protective equipment that it calls for on that label. But first of all, the most important thing really is to make sure you're identifying that insect. Make sure it's on the label of that product that you're using. And then really use chemicals sparingly. If you need to, just spot treatment, you know, just 
to spot treat a limited area where that, you know, that infestation is, is the only place that you really want to treat. Um, so you also want to use pesticides with the lowest impacts as we're talking about IPM, those are going to be things like your biorationals, so your insecticidal soaps, your, your um, microbials, diatomaceous earth, those type of things. You really, really want to try to avoid chemicals that are known to be carcinogenic or neurotoxins or endocrine disruptors, and these are really our conventional chemicals. And then if all else fails, hiring a professional uh, pest control service. So this is just a list um, that will tell you the ways, you know, what you really should do before just calling, calling up and hiring somebody. Really kind of do your due diligence in, um, in hiring a pest control service. Now, on to our, our specific insects now. So these are the common pests that we find here in Florida. I want you to notice that all of them have wings, so they have to get into your house one way or another, right? They're not just going to fly in. So usually that's either from hitchhiking uh, inside food, from, you know, as an egg or as a, an immature or even as an adult. And in some cases, like with bed bugs, they hitchhike either on us or on our luggage or other items that we might bring into the house, like a library book. Or we've been, you know, we've been on an airplane, or we've, you know, we've we've been on a train, or we've been in some sort of an Uber or something. And so they really do find their way into every every place that we, as a public, you know, any public area that that uh, people are. If that makes sense. Okay, so first thing we're talking about is ants. So there are quite a few tiny ant species that seem to invade our homes at any chance that they get. And the common ones that we typically see are like barrel ants, ghost ants, odorous house ants, and crazy ants. And ants usually come inside either looking for water or escaping water. Um, so that means either irrigation or rain, right? So at, you know, they also are looking for food, but the, the big thing really is the, the water sources. Now, as I referred to earlier, vacuuming is, vacuuming is, you know, your vacuum is your friend. Vacuuming, taking out the trash, cleaning up spills, and cleaning the kitchen counters is pivotal to keeping ants out of your house. So you want to remember that ants are very tiny, especially the ones that come into our house. Um, and a small pile of crumbs or a grease spot can feed a colony. So the food that they're typically attracted to are mainly greases and sugary substances. So they're attracted to spills, grease splatters, and other messes that you might forget to clean up. So these are things that get spilled behind the coffee pot or, you know, you know behind your, your utensil container. So you want to really when you're cleaning that counter, make sure you're moving things out of the way and cleaning the entire counter, not just the, the you know, the, the part right up front. So these easier, you know, these areas are pretty easy to clean. You can do it with the soap and water, as you know, we talked about, a, a great way to, to clean, but also a one-to-one -one white vinegar to water solution. Um, this is going to help pick up residues, but it's also going to pick up that pheromone trail. Um, what ants do is as they find food sources, they lay a pheromone trail for the other thousands of ants to make their way to that food source. So soap and water or, or vinegar and water are going to be a great way to, to do that cleaning. Okay, the one thing I do get asked a lot is if cinnamon, if sprinkling cinnamon is going to help keep ants out. And unfortunately, the kind of the overall response to that is no. And you would actually need to use a, a cotton ball that's soaked in liquid cinnamon concentrate, right? But liquid cinnamon concentrate is a much higher concentration than our cooking cinnamon. So you can sprinkle cinnamon around. It's probably not going to help the ants, but it's certainly going to make your kitchen smell good. So oh, overall, it's, it's probably not, not going to work. Now, 
you know, again, for ants, storing food and pet food in containers with tight fitting lids is important. And using caulking or steel wool to seal up around, around pipes. And with, with, uh, with ants, really, that steel wool is not as, ampo as important for ants. Um, you can use either caulking, uh, expanding foam for ants, but you want that steel wool if you know you've had a rodent problem. Now, replacing worn out weather stripping. I'm gonna keep saying these, this over and over again because weather, really weather stripping and caulking are your two, two best friends besides the vacuum. And then um, you wanna follow the ant trail. So you, you know, where they're finding food and entering the home and then you're sealing up those areas. So it, sometimes it takes a lot of patience and persistence to find that trail, but um, you want to try to find where the ants are actually, you know, they may be living outside. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you follow that trail. Then seal, sealing up those cracks on the outside of the house, um, already talked about that. And then when you have an active infestation of ants, you want it, you have to be vigilant about frequently cleaning your floors and your counters and other surfaces um, with that vinegar and water or that, that uh, soapy water because ants are incredibly persistent little critters. So you need to stay on top of it um, and, and make sure those pheromone trails are picked up every single night. Now, um, you know, the other thing about ants is that one, one good thing about them is that because they like, they, they do a sugar substance, um, you may see their baits that I, you know, I was talking about that I really like baits for ants and cockroaches, but those, those tarot type uh, baits, there are borax bait system. Um, you can even make your own. It's a sugar, it's, you know, sugar, water, and borax um, ratio uh, works really well. But buying the ones that are already in a bait station are really effective. And I really recommend those. Um, not so much just tarot, but, but those type of a bait. Now, carpenter ants are a little bit different story. Carpenter ants are one of the largest species of ants, and they can cause damage to your home if, if they're left unchecked. So they do range in size from like six millimeters up to 20 millimeters, so just about a little bit less than an inch um, in length. But they account for about 20% of homeowner complaints. So they nest in areas that have existing voids. And then from there, they, they excavate wood, but they're only found in soft wood. So this means that, that, you know, places where there may have been termite damage or places that may have had some sort of a water intrusion and that's already soft wood. So they can't just, you know, chew through a two by four. It has to be something that's already been um, compromised in some way. Now, copper and ants, they bite, but they don't sting. <clears throat> but those workers can spray a formic acid for defense. And a large nest can have several thousand workers in it. So um, these can become very problematic in your, in your house. Now, identifying carpenter ants, what you're gonna wanna do, you're gonna wanna follow that ant trail and locate that nest. A lot of times they may come into your house, but a lot of times they're located outside. They're most active in the evening um, and they're probably gonna be somewhere in like, you know, a rotting tree stump or in some, you know, wood pile that is left fairly close to the house. But you're gonna to wanna to look for damaged wood in your home. And that's really gonna be a sign of carpenter ant or even termites. But the way to tell the difference whether you have carpenter ants or termites is, is actually fairly easy. What you're gonna to wanna to do is look for these things called kick out holes. And what these are, these are small holes in the wood. And what they do for an ant, they're gonna kick out um, these piles of, you know, like a coarse sawdust, there's gonna be insect body parts, and then other like trash or debris associated with it. So this picture here is an ant pile. So if you get a pile that looks like this and has ant body parts in it, you know for a fact that is you have carpenter ants. Now, if that is all one solid color, that's gonna be dry wood termite uh, frass or their poop. So that is an easy way to tell the difference. If there's body parts, it's definitely gonna be ants or carpenter ants specifically. Now, for, you know, for keeping them out, we've already mentioned caulking and replacing that weather stripping around your, uh, your windows. 
repairing any leaks. But for carpenter ants, it's really important that you're pruning those trees and those shrubs, you know, and the branches that are overhanging or, or touching your house, um, because that is an ant highway. That is as a great way for them to get into your house. Replacing any rotted or wood damaged wood. Since carpenter ants are attracted to those soft woods and those rotten woods, it's really important to repair and replace those. And then fill your tree holes with sand. So if you have a tree right outside that has, um, you know, there, it has lost a limb and there's a little, a little concave area, you put sand in there, um, you're going to keep the water out, you're not, you know, you're going to keep the ants out of there, but it's still going to be an access area that things like an owl can still nest in there or a you know, or, or a raccoon or, you know, some other small bird or other mammal can still use that, that area. So um, it is, when you fill it with sand, it's going to stop that water, which means you won't have mosquitoes breeding in that area as well. And then tree stumps, favorite nesting area for carpenter ants. So removing any tree stumps are also going to help eliminating any nesting sites outside. Now for chemical control, normally I, you know, I say how great baits are. Normally baits are one of the best options for ants, but for carpenter ants, they're unique, of course, um, when it comes to baiting. So when you think about how baits work, now baits require that ants go out, so they, they forage, um, the, you know, the foragers and the workers pick up that bait, they recruit others to that bait, right, because it's a food source, they carry it back to the nest and then they feed everyone so that and then that active ingredient goes throughout the nest and it, it kills the entire nest. Well, with carpenter ants, they're really slow to recruit um, to the bait, they're slow to recruit other workers to that bait, and they're also slow at eating bait. So they're pretty finicky eaters as well. So they're going to ignore anything that's kind of out of the ordinary for them. So baits don't typically or don't always work um, with this particular ant species. However, um, you know, there are baits out there for carpenter ants and they've gotten better about, you know, how they, they produce these baits. So it just takes a little bit more time with, with carpenter ants. With that said, um, since carpenter ants can damage your home, it's kind of important to be proactive and act fairly quickly, you know, to resolve, you know, an infestation, especially if you know that they've been in your house for, for a while or if you hadn't noticed it. Um, you don't really have the luxury of time on your hand, you know, on your side when it comes to carpenter ants. But the other thing, if you are using um, baits, um, don't use baits and insecticides at the same time, right? A spray insecticide, it's counterproductive, it's not going to work, so don't do that. And then lastly, you know, hire a professional, sorry, I forgot to do that, um, hire a professional if you, if you are unable to get that colony under control, because again, they can do a lot of damage if they're left unchecked. Now, cockroaches. I know everybody loves their cockroaches, right? So the German cockroach is the most prolific, um, and it's a domestic cockroaches. It's the one that actually lives with us. It lives in the same environment that, that, that we do. A American cockroach is called peridomestic. It actually lives outside and around our homes. It typically will not live inside our homes. It may live under our homes. Um, it can be in the sewer, but it doesn't typically be inside the house with us. But I wanted to just give you a, a idea here. Here's an American cockroach, and this is a German cockroach. And those are relative sizes to each other. So kind of gives you an indicator of how small the German cockroach is compared to how large the American cockroach is. So if you see a tiny cockroach in your house that has wings, most more than likely that's going to be a German cockroach. Now roaches look for warm places um, where they can have shelter, where they can find food and water, and that really describes our modern house, right? Um, cockroaches are especially fond of kitchens and bathrooms, and that's due to the abundance of moisture and just water sources in general. And an infestation of a cockroach uh, is a health hazard. So cockroaches are, you know, they're not only ugly nu nuisances, they can also be a threat to your health. 
because you know they aggravate allergies um, and and they can cause you know people to have asthma and that's through those molts and that fecal matter that they leave behind but they also bring in germs and bacteria with them on their feet um, and on their bodies wherever they grow and then they go and then they walk across our food and our plates and our cups so um, it's really important to 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 make sure you you uh, you're on top of any sort of cockroach infestation in your house. But even if you see, you know, even if the sight of a cockroach doesn't bother you, right? If you have a high tolerance for cockroaches, if you see multiple cockroaches in your home, then you really should get an opinion of a pest control company um, to make sure you don't have a full on, you know, full blown infestation. Um, you need to really protect your health and the health of your family. Um, you know, you have enough to worry about. Cockroaches should not be the thing on that, you know, added to that list. Now for prevention, again, you know, I talked about not leaving food out or pet food out. And here's another thing, don't leave dirty dishes out in the sink overnight, right? A lot of people exhausted by the end of the night. I understand, I'm, I'm one of those too. But at least rinse your dishes off. If you can't, if you don't wash them or put them in the dishwasher, at least rinse that food off, right? Because that food is gonna be a buffet for those roaches or ants if you're in the house. Clean up any spilled food and drink immediately, right? And again, don't leave it because it may dry and then you forget about it. And then keep your outside pet food dishes away from the door. You know, a lot of people like to, you know, you know feed feral cats. That's, that's great. Just don't put it right next to your door because you're gonna be attracting um, those insects as well as rodents or maybe other wildlife closer to your door and you know, and you risk the chance of them coming in. And again, cleaning up your kitchen counters, your tables and your floors with, you know, for, you know, crumbs are a buffet, grease spotters are a buffet for cockroaches. But then you can do things like you can MacGyver your, your own, you know, trap. So you can make, you know, homemade roach traps. What you can do is you, you place a piece of banana peel inside of a mason jar and you line the, the rim of that mason jar on the inside with petroleum jelly. And then you can pit that jar underneath the sink, usually near where the pipes enter the home because they like that moisture. And especially if you've had some leak in there. But what happens is those roaches are going to be attracted to that banana peel. They're going to climb up into that mason jar and then they're not going to be able to climb back out because of that petroleum uh, jelly along the, the lip or the rim of that, that jar. Of course, you're then going to have some live cockroaches in this jar, but you can do things like you can then fill the jar halfway with a soapy water and drown them, or you can walk out into the, you know, out into the field and release them because outside they're detritivores and they're a great food source for other uh, wildlife. So other things, you know, keeping your garbage in plastic bags and taking out your garbage several times a week. Um, also keeping that garbage can clean, both your great, your big garbage can outside, but your kitchen garbage can. What I do for my kitchen garbage, I make sure I, I wash it, you know, as, as often as I need. Um, but then I also, after it's dried, I put baking soda on the bottom of that trash can before I put the bag back in it. Um, that's going to you know, pick up the any smells, right? So it's going to soak up any smells, but it's also going to soak up anything that gets spilled in there so that I don't have a bigger problem. And then make sure you're rinsing, rinsing out anything that goes into the recycling, um, both if you have your re recycling bin inside your house, but also the one outside. It's always good just to give a quick rinse to those things. And a lot of times people forget about the drip pan on the bottom of the refrigerator. So that drip pan, you know, it catches the condensation in the water from our refrigerator. So it is a perfect place for cockroaches to, to hide and to breed because it's, it's warm, it's got water source, and it's quiet. It's really undisturbed. But back to the cardboard. <laughs> I, I, cannot, I cannot stress this enough. Roaches live in that cardboard. And American cockroaches glue their egg cases to that corrugation. So you want to make sure you rid yourself of any cardboard that's in your house or cardboard that's in your garage. You know, you can do it over time. If you use them as storage boxes, just buy a couple of, of plastic bins a week or a month, whatever, and start, 
you know, changing out and putting your stuff into those plastic bins. Another suggestion, if you do that, make sure you're always buying the same plastic bins so that they stack a lot easier. Now, you know, we've already talked about, you know, about storing food in sealed containers, caulking ceiling around open, oh, around pipes, repair and replace your weather stripping. But for cockroaches, again, those boxes, really important. Um, I didn't realize I had two, two, two slides of this, I apologize. Now for chemical control, um, if you're using chemicals, like always, make sure you're reading the, the label and you're identifying that pest. Important, it doesn't just, it's not gonna just say cockroach, it's gonna tell you what cockroach species. So it's important to know which cockroach species it is as well. Same goes for ants. So you always not only need to know what, you know, generally what it is, you need to know specifically what, what's, what's, um, uh, or what family it's in. Like, is it a red imported fire ant or, or is it an Argentine ant or is it a ghost ant kind of thing? So with cockroaches, I highly suggest baits. Baits are a great alternative to using any sort of a spray product for cockroaches and ants. Baits usually come in like a gel form um, or, or a kind of a peanut butter based and they're in an applicator, a syringe tube, makes it a lot easier to, to uh, apply. Make sure you follow the label on how to apply it. But baits are usually applied in small droplets and that small droplet is about the size of a penny or a, a Hershey Kiss kind of size, even smaller. The good thing about baits, and not a lot of people know this about baits, but cockroach baits, the, you're, you're also working with them on um, using their, their behaviors. Now, you can get what's called a tertiary kill through cockroaches. So you can, you can, you can eliminate multiple generations of cockroaches. And this is because, let's, you know, I'll run you through it real quick. So the adult will eat the bait. The adults go back and they, they defecate right around the nursery area because the immatures, those first, second, and third instars, those really small ones, feed on fecal matter. So then they eat the fecal matter, which has bait in it because the baits don't work right away. And that's a good thing because you want it to transfer through the whole colony. So the nymphs then eat that fecal matter. So the adult will eventually die. The nymphs will die, but the adults that haven't fed on the bait they, the males especially, eat the nymphs. So they will go and eat a nymph that has been, you know, has died from the, the, um, the product, and then they will die. So that's called a tertiary kill. It's, it's pretty amazing. So for bait stations, you can also MacGyver your own bait station. I talked about MacGyvering it with a banana, you know, using banana peel. But for cockroach baits, what you want to do um, this is one I've made. Um, this is just an uh, um, inverted butter tub. You cut little holes in it because if it is, if the cockroach bait that you're using does have a, is a peanut butter base, it's you know, going to be attractive to your, to your pets. So if you cut these little holes in it, that allows cockroaches to get in, but no, you know, no pets can get into it. Um, and then I always put an, I, I glue a piece of cardboard, just makes it a little bit easier, a little bit cleaner. And then I put the bait on that little piece of cardboard. Another thing you can do is, um, you know, you can like inject boric acid into cracks, boric acid into the cracks and crevices using one of those little puffer balls. Um, you know, it's a little hand applicator because uh, bor boric acid or, or borates are, are low toxicity, you know, minerals. They're great to use for, uh, for pest control. Also great to use for your cleaning your clothes. So uh, boric acids and um, diatomaceous soil earth as well, um, but not so much against adult uh, American cockroaches, but very good against German cockroaches. Now fleas. Uh, in, in the US, we mainly have the cat flea, um, but cat fleas infest cats and dogs, other animals, you know, wildlife, but the adult flea stays on the host. And then, you know, fleas can transmit a few diseases, you know, although it's, it's not real, real common. Um, they are the intermediate host to the dog tapeworm. What happens is the pet's going to um, ingest, as it's cleaning itself, it ingests those flea eggs while they're grooming. And then 
the egg hatches in, you know, inside the, the dog, and then it releases that tapeworm. So, you know, I do, I am a proponent of, of keeping your pets on, on flea medication. Fleas are usually a problem for, uh, you know, for people or, or, or pets because of uh, allergic dermatitis. So they do cause, you see a lot of dogs that have lost their fur. That's because they're allergic to the fleas. Now, fleas can complete their life cycle, you know, going from egg to an adult in as little as 30 days up to 75 days. So it all just depends on the conditions. The warmer and the more humid the environment, the quicker that life cycle is going to be. So the way a life cycle works for a flea is that um, the adult stays on the host and feeds on the host. It lays its eggs on the host, but those eggs fall off, right? They don't, they don't glue the eggs to the hair, say like a, a lice does, right? Um, head lice glues their eggs to the, the host. The flea does not do that. So what happens is wherever that pet lays, those eggs are going to fall into that area. But also that because those adults feed on blood, their fecal matter is going to be, you know, dried blood, basically. And so that is also, you see that that flea dander is what we call it on our pets. Um, that actually falls off into their, where they're laying, whether it's in their pet bed or on your couch or on your rug, wherever that pet is, that flea dander is going to fall off, but that's where their eggs are going to be. That's where the larvae is going to be. So the larvae feeds on that, that flea dander, also feeds on any other organic matter that might be in that area as well. Um, but as you look here, this is the bottom of a carpet. So you see some flea eggs, but here we see flea larvae. They, they look like little worms or little, little maggots. So again, the adult stays on the host but the, the larvae and the, the eggs do not stay on the host. They are where that, that pet is going to be laying or sleeping. But very important then um, to keep your pet bedding clean. I really, you know, I recommend washing that bed at least, you know, if you've had a problem, washing it at least weekly, if you can, washing it in hot water, um, that's going to kill both the flea eggs as well as that larvae. Vacuuming, making sure you're vacuuming around the area, especially where you're they they lay, but you know, vacuuming your whole house because a random flea will jump off. So you can you can vacuum up those adult fleas that are just kind of randomly out there. Although most of the time they're going to be on, on a host. Make sure you're vacuuming underneath your furniture, under cushions. Um, and with that vacuum bag, if you still have a traditional vacuum bag, you can do a couple of things. You know, you're going to have live critters in there, right? So you can either put that in a Ziploc bag and put it in the freezer, right? Because those bags are not cheap. So put it in the freezer until next time you need to use that vacuum and you take that bag out because what it's going to do, it's going to kill those eggs and those larvae that are in that bag. And so you will still have that bag, um, you know, so you can reuse it. Um, the other thing you can do is just go ahead and, and throw it out, right? So, but I would still recommend putting it in some sort of a Ziploc or a tied bag before you put it in the garbage so those things are not coming out of it. And then sweeping and mopping the floors uh, regularly again, especially after you have, uh, you, you know you've had a flea infestation because those eggs could be, if those, that dog plays a lot and it's running through the house, it could, those eggs could be falling off that, that, uh, that dog while it's playing. Now, in order to check for adult fleas, um, pretty easy. You can do this both inside your house or outside. A lot of times people are getting bites and they don't know what's doing it. This is a good way to check to see if it's fleas. Put on a pair of white tube socks and walk around the area that you, you keep getting bit or you sus suspect you might have fleas. What's going to happen is those fleas are going to jump onto your onto your onto those white socks. They're going to show up as, as little black specks. They're pretty small, but you can see it and you'll start seeing them move. Um, but because fleas only feed on, on blood, they, they want to be on a host. They do not want to be just out in the open uh, because they have to eat quite often. I did it again. I'm so sorry. So that, that was the rest of my what I was talking about. <laughs> so keeping your pet out of infested areas is really important. Um, 
you're going to, you know, this is going to be because if you have wild critters around, um, you don't want them to be nesting like underneath your, your deck or underneath your pool, you know, if, if you have a, you know, a raised pool area or any sort of thing like that, or, you know, an area underneath your house, a lot of times in Florida, we, we don't have crawl spaces, but if you do, keeping wild animals away from those areas are important because they're going to be harboring uh, fleas in those areas as well. So, you know, it's good to shore up, especially if you have like crawl spaces, shoring that up with, with mesh screen. So that's keeping them from going, going in there. But if you have an indoor outdoor pet, make sure you're just keeping them on um, some sort of uh, flea medication is, is important. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and go through this because I don't wanna stop again. So if you're using a flea prevention, okay, I totally recommend, um, wanna make sure you're never using a dog product on your cat. They are not interchangeable. Always read the label and make sure that you're applying it correctly, right? Because some of those, um, the ones that you apply to the back of the neck, say apply to the back neck, some of them, you put it all the way down the, you know, the backbone of, of the dog from the neck to the tail. It just depends. Um, you know, I, I give a quick story. I had, you know, I had a woman who came in once and she thought she had such a big problem with fleas. She was treating her cat every week with flea treatment. She didn't read the label. It's a once a month treatment. She ended up, it was very detrimental for her cat. I'll put it that way. So make sure you're following that label. They put a lot of effort into those labels. So you need, you know, you, you can be confident when you're using those products, um, if, as long as you're using it according to the label. Now, flea treatments usually use an IGR, right? That instant growth regular that I was talking about as that active ingredient, and it's a great product. Some products contain uh, uh, both an IGR and a, uh, a, an adulticide, which um, is, you know, kills mainly the adults. And then the IGR works on those immature stages. And you're gonna see a lot of times, you're gonna see fipronil and imidacloprid as the adulticide, as that, that active ingredient in there to, that kills the, the adults. Um, I would really be cautious and I would like to say, please avoid using flea collars on your animals. Um, they're, not, they're not very effective and they can actually be quite harmful to your pet. Um, if they get stuck in their mouths, you know, they end up, they can get cuts on their mouths. They can choke from that. They can end up chewing through that. And so then ingesting not only the plastic, but it, they're ingesting a high level of that insecticide as well. That should not be interior. It should be external of that pet. So um, I, I really, I don't like flea collars. Um, you know, I prefer doing either something that you give them in a pill form or the topicals. But when you're treating for fleas, try to treat um, your pet your home, and if needed, your yard on the same day or in a, a short time frame of each other. That's so that you're going to make sure you're you're starting from scratch, right? So you're getting rid of those adults and those eggs and those larvae stages all at the same time so that you, you can make sure and feel confident that you've really conquered your flea problem. When you're treating indoor for fleas, um, I know I talk about that boric acid or, or borates work they're great. They work great against fleas. You can sprinkle it around all over your house, really, you know, where your pet may be. You sprinkle that around, you let it sit for a while, and then you vacuum it up. Works. I, I really like those, those borates. Um, outdoors, you can use some sort of a, a spray chemical. Um, most of the time, it's a pyrethroid. Um, that's if you know you have, like, you're talking about that wild animal that's underneath or you know, wildlife that's underneath your deck that you just can't get to. Using a pyrethroid in that area or a, a chemical in that area is, you know, is something that is, you, is you know, justified. However, you do not need to use it. You don't need to spray your entire yard. Remember, as we talk about that life cycle, those fleas are not going to just be hanging, those adult fleas are not going to be hanging out in the yard waiting to jump on something. They want to be where that pet or that animal is sleeping. So you can really just focus on the areas that you know those animals are, right? 
So that's going to stop you from using too many chemicals or too much chemical. Um, and then it's really not necessary, right? So you're keeping money in your pocket too. Um, flea combs. So talking about things like flea combing and bathing, flea combs remove about 60% of the fleas on your animal. But if you follow that up with shampooing, that shampooing is really important because it's, you want to remove that dry blood, right? So it gets rid of that, that flea, um, the, the, the flea matter that is on there, that you know, flea matter and the skin flakes that is organic matter that the larvae then feed on. So flea combing and shampooing are fabulous ways to, to cut down on the, on the flea problem. Now, there are other products that you can use, like you know, a lot of times you see cedar chips. Um, not a lot of scientific backing behind that, but one, they smell good. And two, they do have some repellent activity to them. So um, again, just follow the label, make sure that you're not, you know, cats are really sensitive to, to uh, essential oils and to things, you know, to smells basically. So just be cautious and make sure you're not harming, you know, harming your any, either any of your pets, pets by trying to help them by minimizing fleas. Now, things that may or may not work against fleas. So, like, you know, we talk, we, we see things like garlic supplements, uh, vitamin B or yeast. Now, these have, you know, they may have some great, you know, health benefits for your pet. I don't know. Um, but there's really not a lot of scientific backing to prove that they actually work against fleas. Those ultrasonic or insecticidal flea collars, the ultrasonic don't even bother, not effective in the least. You know, talked about like cedar ship, cedar chips or, or like wax myrtle leaves or another thing. Um, they do have some repellent properties, which are good. Now, pantry pests. So these are pantry pests or product pests. Um, this is a group of insect insects that infest, you know, a whole bunch of different uh, products in your pantry. So your grains, your flowers, your dried pastas, dried dog food, uh, dog food treats, and bird food. Those are the ones we think about. But there are some things that we don't usually think about that may be infested with insects. Dried flower arrangements, uh, beans or seed mosaics. Remember those things that our, our kids made for us in kindergarten? Um, dried bread dough ornaments. Again, they made those for us for the holidays. Pork boards. Dried peppers, that's a big one. Um, I actually just had to get rid of some dried peppers because they got infested. Potpourri, tobacco, um, our pharmaceutical drugs, so right, our prescriptions. So there's a lot of different things that actually can get infested by these uh, stored product pests. Now, pantry pests rarely, rarely require any sort of a chemical intervention. So the key to controlling these these any of these pests really is to find the infested product and dispose of it. So this is going to, you know, eliminate the infestation. Um, although there's still going to probably be some random insects walking around, right? Because they're not all going to be inside that product. They're going to be like, this is an Indian meal moth. Um, you're going to see them flying around. You're, you may be, see, you know, seeing some drug, drugstore beetles or some cigarette beetles flying around. So there's going to be those random insects. So what you're going to want to do, you want to either, you know, throw out the infested food, but like I talked about, like with the other things, put it in a plastic bag first, you know, Ziploc it closed or tie it closed, put it in the freezer for, you know, 24 hours and then throw it in the garbage so you know those things are dead. Um, you want to vacuum your pantry on the cracks and crevices, right? You want to clean those shelves and the bins with soap and water. You know, back to the caulking. Caulk those areas around those, you know, sealing those cracks. And that's where those crumbs are going to fall down. And that's going to be a, a you know, place that they're feeding. So caulking those shelving areas, it, it can be real beneficial. There's a big one is cleaning your containers before you refill them with new food. This is for dog food. This is for flour. Um, this is for pastas. So what happens is that a lot of those things still have crumbs. Like we'll talk about dog food, right? That, but that the crumbs on the bottom of that empty container may actually have some eggs in there as well. So before you put new food in there, that's you know you're if you don't clean it first, may get reinfested. 
So before you put it in, go ahead and, and clean it out with soap and water and dry it and then put the new, new food into it. So always use up the old food first, clean it, and then put in the new stuff. This is a great time to clean out your pantry. <laughs> so um, also inspect your pantry. If you've had a, a, a stored product pest infestation of some sort, inspect your pantry every week until you don't see any more um, you know, insects flying around or walking around. So that's, that's really important. And once you have it clean, keep it clean, right? Make sure you're rotating those products, especially your pastas, right? Pastas can come from the store infested and it's not the store's fault. There's a lot of thing, places that, that, that pasta is once it leaves the manufacturer and once it gets onto the, the shelf of your store. It has to be stored, it has to be shipped. So there's a lot of potential to get infested along the way. So don't be blaming your, your grocery store for if you buy an infested product. It's probably not their fault because it doesn't stay in their warehouse very long at the store. Now, for um, you know, other things, so, you know, I, I talk about, you know, you can't blame your store, but you can inspect the food before you buy it. So these, again, especially your grains and your pastas, because those boxes are open, they're, they're not sealed closed, they're not surrounded in plastic. Um, so inspect it before you bring it home. Don't buy any food um, that has been opened or is damaged, because that's a real good, you know, especially like powdered mixes, right? If you find the box is a little, has, you know, an area on it that, that's been ripped, you know, they it may be infested. Using your dry food within two to four months of purchasing is, is kind of important because you, you're going to stop that, that cycle. You're not going to, you know, if it sits in there and then gets infested and then it's going to have multiple generations for you to try to try to maintain or not maintain, but try to get eliminate. Storing your food in airtight containers. Again, that's, you know, we're going back to that airtight container. Anything that has a, a tight sealing lid, especially with a rubber gasket. Um, but if you can store it in the refrigerator, that's even better. But if it has to be in your pantry, remember that insects really like heat. Heat rises. So the top of your pantry might not be huge, but the top of your pantry is going to be a little bit warmer than the bottom of your pantry. So you're going to want to stir your pastas, your flowers, your dog food, uh, your dog food treats, anything like that. Store that lower in your pantry and then store your canned foods higher up because they're typically not going to, they're not going to infest your canned foods. Um, I'm, you know, with, with insecticides, again, you know, read the label first. They really, you really don't need to, to um, use pesticides for a pantry pest infestation. Get rid of that product um, and then use your vacuum you know, use your elbow grease to do some cleaning, and then you're pretty good. Um, if you want to reuse food that, um, like your, your, if your pasta has some granary weevil in it that you're like, but I really need this pasta or it's some special pasta, um, you know, and you're, you're, a lot of us just need to watch our dimes. What you can do to keep that, um, I would suggest freezing that for a week just to make sure that you've been able, you've definitely killed all of those uh, eggs that are in that pasta. But also you can either then, um, besides freezing it, you can heat it, heat it at 140 degrees for 30 minutes. So um, you can do either of those things if you wanna keep that pasta, but if not, you know, tie it up and throw it away. Okay, silverfish. Now, they're one of the few insects that continue to molt through their entire life. So most insects stop molting once they reach adult stage. So silverfish actually will molt about 28 times in their life, in their life cycle. So they eat starchy material, um, everything from book bindings to wallpaper glue, but they especially like glossy paper. They love to hide in dark locations. So removing old newspapers, magazines, books, uh, and fabrics that are stored in cardboard boxes um, for long periods of time is, is really important to, to, um, to make sure you're checking those areas. So silverfish, they thrive in moist, humid environments. So if you see them in your home, you're more than likely have some sort of a moisture problem. 
You want to make sure you're, uh, you're fixing your water leaks, you're increasing your ventilation, you're sealing openings around your pipes and your gaps in the walls um, as we've kind of gone over for the other insects as well. Lowering that humidity in your home uh, by running the AC or their fans. Keeping the humidity below 50% is gonna really help you manage both insects and mold and mildew. So finally, vacuum uh, the infested areas, right? Vacuum your friend. But you're also gonna be, uh, you know, you're gonna vacuum floors and furniture. So you're removing all those, uh, you know, eggs and, and other stages of, of silverfish that may be there. Now, you know, vacuum often. You're cleaning out those closets regularly because they love to hide in, in dark areas. Cleaning under your sinks and your refrigerators, anywhere where it's dark and it's moist, right? So those are gonna be our, our bathrooms, our kitchens, and, and our refrigerator. Repairing plumbing leaks, as I said. Uh, they're a real source of, of moisture for silverfish. And if you have a silverfish problem, you may have a plumbing leak and reducing your humidity, uh, increasing your ventilation is drying out the environment is gonna be really uh, key to, to uh, minimizing any, any infestations of silverfish in your house. Now, storing food in containers with tight fitting lids as we talked about with gaskets really is really important. Using caulk or steel wool around your pipes uh, is gonna help to, to keep these guys out. Replacing your worn weather stripping around doors and windows, right? We're, we're, we're talking about the same things over and over again. But inspect your stored boxes before you're bringing them to your house, really important. Then for chemical intervention, um, essential oils from Japanese cedar actually have, have shown to be very effective against these. So you can use it out, uh, you know, outside around your doors and your windows, under your, your roof eaves, under decks and porches and around the foundation. But then inside, you want to apply an insecticide dust, like in a very fine layer. We've kind of talked about this already, but, but DE, boric acid powders, work really well. Don't allow those things to get wet or else they're, they're, that renders them ineffective. But again, outside the house, you can use that Japanese cedar oils, essential oil. Inside, you can use those, uh, those powders. Now, we have to remember that you know with spiders, all spiders are good because they eat insects, but we're not always excited when they are lurking in the corners of our homes with us. But most indoor spiders build webs in the corners. So, uh, you know, if there is not enough food for them to survive in, in the house, then they're going to move to another area. So the ones that are found on the floor are typically not, whole, they're just home invaders. They're not ones that want to live in our, in our homes with us. They really just came in by accident. So what to do if you have spiders? So to be completely you know, sure to eliminate the spider, you're gonna wanna you know, use a vacuum. I would either, I'd rather put them, put them on a broom and take them outside and put them outside because again, they're beneficial insects. But inside, if you want to, to just use the vacuum, you can vacuum them up because that's also gonna vacuum up their webbing and their eggs. Or, like I said, you can take it out on a broom and then vacuum up that webbing and any eggs to make sure there's no residuals of that spider left in your house. Make sure when you, before you put on your clothes and your, your, your shoes, make sure you sh shake those things out so that you don't have those smaller spiders that might be hiding in them because they, they will bite you because you know they're, they, they're in a defensive mode. Be sure to destroy any egg sacs that you may egg sacs that you may find um, so that they don't hatch out. And I always make sure you're you're using uh, you're wearing gloves uh, when you're cleaning around, especially around spider webs, so you're protecting yourself from from any potential of getting bit. Now, again, they like those things that are on the exterior of our house that are close to your house. So don't store firewood in or near your home. Make sure you're sealing up any boxes with tape before you store them. As I've said before, you probably want to get rid of your cardboard boxes, but using tape around all those edges is going to keep any insects out of those, those boxes. Using caulking, right? Here's our, our caulking and our weather stripping again to seal up those openings around plumbing uh, pipes, your ducts, your electrical, electrical wiring where it's coming into, in, into your home. Now, repairing your windows and your door screens, really, you know, common areas of where air, uh, where spiders especially can get through. Inspect your boxes, your furniture, or any other items before you bring them into your home. I am one that loves curbside pickups, right? So I also know to, to check 
uh, those for any insect infestations before I bring them into my home. Pruning your vegetation away from their house, very important, right? We talked about that as being an insect highway for things like you know termites and ants, but also for spiders. And then keeping those outdoor lights off at night <clears throat> or using that yellow light bulb, uh, that yellow LED light bulb so that they don't attract insects to that area that spiders are gonna then feed on. Now, spiders are actually quite difficult to control with pesticides since their webs uh, make contact with that spider fairly difficult. So if you do need to use a chemical, you know, as a last resort, right? Dust formulations are gonna work best. So dust formulations in the attic, attic areas as well, um, because what happens with those dust formulations is that they cling to that web. And as that, that spider crawls across that web is then gonna pick up that, that uh, product. Uh, spray formulations, I really don't suggest uh, because inside the house, one, you don't want to really be spraying pesticides inside your house, but also you're usually kind of underneath that webbing. So you're spraying and then that pesticide is going to rain down on you. So no matter what, whatever you, it, whatever product you are using, make sure you're reading that label and you're wearing the proper PPE that is called for on that label. Now, small flies. So these are called filth breeding flies. Uh, you want to make sure that you're doing a correct identification. It's really important, especially for small flies. And then some of the you know, common ones that are in our house are things like fungus gnats, uh, fruit flies, forward flies, and drain flies or drain moss. Actually are a fly, but they are called drain flies. I mean, drain moss. So filth breeding flies are attracted to organic matter. So that includes food in the kitchen, including food in the garbage and food in the, the recycling, but it also includes the organic matter that are in your drains. So things you wanna do, you wanna make sure you're taking out the garbage several times a week to make sure you're keeping that organic matter down, keeping your trash in a closed container and keeping that container clean on the inside and the outside. Cleaning your toilets, your sinks, your showers, your tile floors. Really important to keep any of that organic debris off of those areas. And then clean any organic matter out of the drains. So once those drains are clean, flush them with boiling water. So you're going to want to make sure you're also rinsing out any uh, recycling, right? Because that's going to sometimes have some organic matter. And then keeping those recycling bins clean. Next you know, overripe fruit or vegetables uh, from, from the store may be infested with fly larvae. So I'm one of those, I love to buy those overripe bananas to make banana bread, but sometimes I leave them out on the counter. But you gotta remember that those, those, those products that you're bringing home, those fruits and those vegetables that may already be ripe or, ripe or overripe can already be infested with fly larvae from the store. But other things like you're, you make sure you're eating your fresh fruits and your vegetables quickly and store them in the refrigerator in the meantime. And then any fruit that you need to ripen, you want to put that in a paper bag and seal the, the, you know, seal the top by folding that top down and securing it with a clothespin or some sort of a clip so that things, you know, especially fruit flies and, and other uh, filth breeding flies can't get into that bag. And then never, ever do not leave cut fruit on the counter because that is just, uh, you know, just calling those, those flies in to infest that and to lay their eggs. So if you do have fruit flies, you can, again, MacGyver your own fruit fly trap. So putting either an inch of either wine or fruit juice or sugar water or sugar and vinegar mixture on the bottom of a bottle with a narrow neck is going to be really great to attract those flies to it. So it's going to attract those in. They're going to go down to the bottom to that, you know, that sweet smelling liquid, and then they're going to drown within that, that, um, that liquid. Now for fungus nets. Fungus nets can come into your home with the plants that you buy. Um, so make sure you're, you know, you're checking your plants that there's not little gnats flying around when you're purchasing those plants. 
And then you know, the best thing to do is really allow that soil in, in your plant to dry out before you you're watering them. So make you know the fly larvae, the uh, fungus, sorry, fungus gnat larvae live in that top inch of soil and they eat the organic matter. So if you allow that to dry out, then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna eliminate or really minimize any fungus nets that are around the area. And if you end up are like me, I'm a heavy hand when it comes to watering my plants. So I sprinkle mosquito bits in the top of those pots because mosquito bits are impregnated with, with it's, it's uh, corn cob impregnated with BTI, which is a microbial that, that controls fungus gnat and mosquito larvae. So if you sprinkle those mosquito bits in the top of your, your plant, the top of the soil of your plants, as you water it, it's going to, that, that BTI that's impregnated on that, that corn cob is going to come off going into the soil. Those fungus gnat larvae are going to then eat that BTI and it will kill those larvae. Now, our last one, bed bugs. Now, bed bugs are challenging because, you know, they are fairly small, although you can see them, but adults are that deep rest, rust colored um, because they feed on blood, they're going to be red. Um, they are the size of an apple seed when they've been feeding, and then the nymphs are actually clear and they are difficult to see. So the challenge is, you know, visual detection is pretty difficult. And then early infestations of these, these uh, insects tend to go unnoticed because like the nymphal stage is really small. If you look at this, um, there are 15 nymphs within the head. This is a Phillips screw, the head of a Phillips screw. So that tells you how small those, those nymphal stages are. But early control is more likely to be successful. Um, you're, you know, you're not going to see those those bed bugs spread throughout the area. But it's also going to be the cheapest time to control those, right? So making sure you are are inspecting your um, your luggage as you bring them home from holiday is really important. Now, where to look for bed bugs? There are primary harborage areas which are right around the, the, uh, the bed, and that's going to be where 70% of those bed bugs are found. And then your secondary harborages are those areas about five feet out of the bed, and about 23% of the bed bugs are found in that area. And then the other areas um, outside of that, about 7% of bed bugs are going to be found. So really, when you go into any sort of a, you know, a hotel room or area, those bed bugs can really be, be, be found anywhere in that room, but the most of them, 70%, are going to be found right there around that, that um, bed. Now, those primary harbage areas are things like the mattress, especially around the beading on the mattress, right? So you, you pull off those sheets and you want to check that beading. If you see little red spots, um, hightail it out of that room. I forgot to mention, when you go in to inspect your, your hotel room, bring your luggage in, but put it in the bathtub. Really important because there are not going to be any bed bugs in the bathtub. It's porcelain, it's cold, it's inhospitable. So put your luggage, your, your purse, anything you have in the bathtub or in the shower, right? And um, leave it there until you've done your inspection. I actually then still leave my, my luggage in my bathroom as often as I can when I'm in a hotel. Anyway, again, the mattress, really important. Pull those sheets off and check around that 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 beating. The bed frame itself is, you know, is a, a really common place where they're going to harbor. Your box springs, the linen and the dust ruffle, another important area where you you might see those, especially, um, you know, especially the nymphs will be around this area too. The headboards and the wall mounts, all those areas are within, you know, 70% of those bed bugs are going to be found in that area. And then your secondary secondary bed bug harbage areas are going to be places like the nightstand, um, the dressers, those tables and chairs that are around. In the cracks of those chairs, make sure you're checking in those, those cracks. The carpeting and the baseboard, really important as well. And then those that 7%, remember that the other harbage areas are going to be your wall outlets. Um, really important, you know, if you can, if you can take off that wall outlet uh, uh, plat, the, the plate, and look underneath. 
because there may be some bed bugs hiding there. Picture frames, smoke detectors, popcorn ceiling, which scares the death out of me because, you know, looking at this, you may have thought that might have been a small spider, but in all actuality, it potentially can be a bed bug as well. But the problem with, with uh, like, units like you see this electrical right that's that's going to both sides of those walls so if bed if it's heavily infested in the next room i would definitely be checking too to make sure i would take this off anyway just to just to make sure but really what i'm saying is that they can be anywhere make sure you're you're checking your your hotel room prior to sleeping in it so with that i want to say thank you these are the resources that i use for today's presentation um, if you have any questions, here is my information. I'm happy to assist. You can email me, you can call me, but I want to say thank you for joining me today in learning about how to keep insects out of your home through uh, use of integrated pest management. Have a wonderful rest of your day.